we'll talk about body organization. There are two parts to this chapter. For part one, we're going to discuss how living things are organized from simple to complex. We'll go over the positive and negative feedback loops, as well as how we maintain normal limits. At the core, anatomy and physiology is really the st study of structure and function. So the anatomy is really the parts and the physiology is how it works. There are subspecialties within anatomy, physiology, histology, cytology, embryology are just a couple of many, many um, subspecialties. Body organization from complex to simple starts from the organism, the whole person. You can then subdivide that whole person down into organ systems, whether it's the skin, mean the integumentary system or the skeletal system or the cardiovascular system. Within a given system, say cardiovascular, a single organ would be the heart or perhaps blood vessels. It's counted as part of that system. And when you break that down even further, you can see that it is made up of different tissues. If you're looking at the heart, it's going to have muscle tissue, it's going to have nervous tissue. So looking at tissues can in a breakdown from individual organs. From the tissue level, we can actually look at individual cells that are made within the cells. We have organelles that make up a given cell. How we get to organelles are molecules. And finally, the smallest piece is the atom. On a different topic, homeostasis, the term means same stain. We have two control mechanisms, negative feedback, which is the one that's used predominantly, um, is counteracting the original stimulus. If you get hot, you sweat, and you cool down. That's a negative feedback control. Positive feedback control is pretty rare. It's utilized in certain processes of the body, such as labor, a woman giving birth, or blood clotting. So the negative feedback is bringing back something back into range. As I said, if you get hot, you need to bring your temperature back into range so that you will employ various mechanisms like sweating and things that's going to help lower your temperature. So what's the most common form of control? Positive fe feedback, because it's positive, it means it was going to amplify. So one action is going to cause the next action to be greater. Rather. So the positive doesn't mean it's like good or bad, it just means it's getting more and more and more. So for instance, uterine contractions, it starts off with a weak contraction, the next one's gonna be more forceful and more forceful up until a specific endpoint, and then it's done. So the negative feedback process, we're gonna focus on this more because it's the most common. You're gonna have an action, a change away from normal. Maybe you just ate some jelly beans, so you have higher blood glucose. The receptor receives the stimulus to identify that glucose has gotten higher. The control center is gonna process that and say, what are we gonna do about this? And the effector is gonna then figure out a mechanism to carry out the instruction to then lower blood glucose in this example. And then the action is actually bringing it back to a normal level. So for blood glucose, these are the steps that would fall into that scheme. You eat sugar or a jelly bean, Blood glucose levels go up. We've triggered our body because we've gone above normal. The pancreas's job then is to release insulin. Um, blood glucose levels are then ultimately going to go back down into the normal range. And then the pancreas stops the insulin release once it's achieved normal. That's why it's called negative feedback because it really turns on a mechanism, in this case, the pancreas. But when you get to the point where you wanna be, it turns it off again. So that's the negative in that it shuts off. Positive feedback is where it reinforces the stimulus. And I said the two main examples are gonna be blood clotting. You have a cut, a couple of platelets stick together, they become stickier, so more platelets stick together. And then it becomes even stickier and even more platelets stick together. And that forms the initial stages known as a platelet plug. And that's a positive feedback process. So you should feel comfortable now knowing how organizer, things are organized from some, simple to complex. Homeostasis, the difference between positive and negative feedback and an example of a negative feedback cycle, as well as those normal limits. 
Now we'll move on to just basic terminology so that we can have a conversation and continue the rest of this class with utilizing appropriate terminology. There are a list here of anatomical landmarks or a diagram. They're pretty tiny, so you should have these available in your notes somewhere where you are able to identify specific body parts, say your shoulder, you should know the anatomical name or proper name, and that would be a chromial. Or if you have, for instance, lumbar is your lower back. You are responsible for all of these regions knowing the proper anatomical name. Anatomical position for a person is actually hands at the sides, down the sides, but the palms forward. So your thumbs are facing away from your body. The terms supine and prone are pretty common and you should be familiar with those. When we talk about the four abdominal pelvic quadrants, we can see right upper quadrant, left upper, right lower, and left lower. These are used sort of a geographic region if you have some um, incision, you're making reference to this somehow. We also have the abdominal pelvic regions. This is more like a tic-tac-toe board and it's more specific. Obviously it has smaller sections, you should know what the name of each of these regions are. In knowing the name of each of these regions, you should have an idea of what body feature is within the abdominal cavity in each of these regions. For directional terminology, we'll start here with the superior inferior. Superior usually refers to up above towards the head or inferior means down below towards the feet or tail if you want cranial versus caudal. Anterior posterior really means like the front of the body, that's anterior, posterior is the back of the body. Medial and lateral. That means if you're going medial, you're towards the midline of the body. So you divide the body into right and left sides. So medial means closer to that line, lateral means farther away. If you're dealing with your limbs, like arms and legs, then closer to the torso is proximal. Farther away towards your fingers or your toes is known as distal. Superficial and deep, obviously on the surface of your body, or deeper down into the body from the surface side in. And then obviously right and left is always gonna be on the patients, um, right and left. The directional terminology, it's really important to know not just superficial, deep, or proximal, distal. It's not a single word. It's always in reference to another thing. So you, it would be wrong to say the fingers are distal. It would be correct to say the fingers are distal to the wrist. You could say the elbow is proximal to the wrist. So these terms are always in one body part in reference to another body part. The chin is inferior to the mouth. There are three divisions of the body. They are slices as if a giant guillotine were to slice through the body. These are common when looking at CT scans or MRI images. So it's really important to know what the slice is to orient yourself. The three slices or divisions that you need to be familiar with are transverse, that's identified in green, and that would be if the body were to be sliced like across where the belt is. So if it goes across your body and separates you from top to bottom or a superior and inferior portions of your body. A frontal slice would be a slice down the body separating the front or anterior surface from the posterior surface. So in a frontal slice, you would see the outline of a whole body. You either have the back side or the front side. A sagittal slice is if you were to turn that perpendicular and actually have a line going from the middle of the top of your head and it's going down and dividing your body into right and left sides. These are examples of body planes from each of the slices. So the frontal or coronal slice is identified in blue, where we can see the transverse in green and a side view or sagittal slice in red. The cavities within the body, there are two main cavities. We have the dorsal cavity, and it's really just made of 
the cranial cavity where your brain sits or the spinal cavity where your spinal cord is. The ventral cavity has a lot more subdivision areas. So the ventral cavity has thoracic, which is you're gonna find your lungs and your heart. So that pleural cavity is where the lungs would be. The pericardial cavity is where the heart's gonna be. And the mediastinum is just the space in between, right in the middle where it's not heart and it's not lungs. So those are three parts of the thoracic cavity. The abdominal pelvic cavity is below the diaphragm and it's consisted of the ab abdomen or abdominal cavity as well as the pelvis. This is another view where we can see each of the cavities of the ventral cavity with their own color. In the thoracic cavity, we can see the purple is the lung, so that's gonna be the pleural cavity. That turquoise is going to be where the heart is, that's the pericardial cavity, and we have the mediastinum in orange. Down below the diaphragm in red is gonna be the abdominal cavity, where in green, we can see the pelvic cavity. So as a recap, the dorsal cavity contains two portions, the cranial, where the brain would be, as well as the vertebral cavity, where the spinal cord is. The ventral cavity has the thoracic cavity, and it has its three subdivisions, as well as the abdominal pelvic cavity with the two subdivisions that we've already spoken about. You can see there are two additional ones that are not in colors. One is the peritoneal cavity. So within the abdominal cavity, we actually have this peritoneal, which means it's within the sac that is our guts actually are within. And behind the sac that our guts and our intestines are within is known as retroperitoneal, so it's behind. So we don't see those divisions here. We'll talk about those when we cover the GI tract as well as the urinary system. For now, for this chapter, you should be aware of the two regions shown in color here for the abdominal pelvic cavity. Now, serous membranes are known as a double membrane, and it really starts off with, as we can see, the heart above and the image above with the circle below. That heart pushes down into that circle. If you think of that circle as a balloon, it pushes down into it, and we can see to the right, the heart is nestled now within by pushing down, we have two layers. So the blue layer is touching the surface of the heart in this example, and that's known as the visceral layer, and the parietal layer is in green. So it's known as a double layer because it's folded back on itself. We see serous membranes around the lungs, known as the pleura, around the intestines, known as the peritoneum, and around the heart, known as the pericardium. Notice, each one has in blue the visceral layer, which is touching the organ itself, whether it be the lungs, the intestines, or the heart, as well as the parietal layer, which is actually touching the inside of the body wall or the body cavity. So by now, you should be familiar with the surface parts and terms for each of the region, terminology referring to body position, whether it's supine or prone or anatomical position. You should know the quadrants, the four quadrants, as well as the nine regions. You should know directional terms and the proper use of them. So if you were to say superior versus inferior, you're not just saying something is superior, it's always in relationship to something else. The forehead is superior to the nose. Then you should know about the three divisional planes, transverse, frontal, or also known as coronal, and sagittal. You should know about the various body cavities and their subdivisions, as well as the layers that make up the serous membranes.